Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. And I have a feeling we're going to be hearing a lot of Dune quotes. <laughs> also joining us, Jeremy Johns. That's because the Schnepp and I are fans of the Dune. We're going to talk a little bit of Dune, so we're going to get sweaty on some Dune. <laughs> what's going on? What's John what's going Schnepp, on? ladies and gentlemen. What's going on? Hey. And rounding off our panel today, Ken Knapsack. I don't know what's going on, man. This has been <laughs> crazy and fun already. It's raining in Southern California, so I got a hat indoors. <laughs> yeah, I think we, I think we brought the rain back uh, yeah. from New York. All right, what's up first? Okay, according to an exclusive from Variety, Arrival and Blade Runner 2049 Helmer Denis Villeneuve is in early talks to direct Legendary's Dune reboot. It was back before the Thanksgiving holiday when Legendary closed a deal with the Frank Herbert estate for the rights to his iconic novel, which would grant the production company the rights to a new film as well as for TV-based projects. Set in the distant future, Dune is the story of Paul Atreides, whose family controls the desert planet Arrakis. As the only producer of a highly valuable resource control Control of Arrakis is highly contested among noble families. A release date for the new Dune movie has yet to be set. Dennis, what do you think about the Denis Villeneuve talking on, or taking on Dune? I think Villeneuve is actually one of the most talented directors working today. He's, he had that, he's already on a good momentum streak with Prisoners, Sicario, and now Arrival. And then we saw the teaser trailer for Blade Runner 2049 coming out. So I think he's a great fit. He's mentioned that he's been a fan of the series for, for since he was a kid. He also ha was dreaming about directing this, so I think it's a natural fit for him. Um, as far as the movie version, you know, the David Lynch one, I actually like that one, despite it being kind of kooky and uh, different th than the actual book series. Uh, I also watched Joe Rossi's Dune, where his version also was also out there and was a different take. I have a feeling this is going to be a much maybe more serious take. I think, Schnepp, you had mentioned like more like a Game of Thrones style. Mm -hmm. I'm all for that, so I'm excited for this, Schnepp. Yeah, I mean, I, and also Legendary has the movie and television rights, so I think what they're doing is probably having uh, uh, Velenu do the films, but set up the Game of Thrones television series, sort of like how Dark Tower was being set up, like do a movie, then a series, then a movie, then a series. That's at least how I'd like to see it, and I also am a giant fan of David Lynch's Dune, I can quote it nonstop. By the juice of Safu, so I set my mind in motion. All the we were just doing a ton of them. It's, a, it's an endless array of quotes from that. Get with it, become a Ben Gesserit witch. I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> Shave your head, get some metal teeth, walk around with a weird robe. <laughs> Jeremy, it's true. Schnepp and I were getting kind of sweaty about Dune. We were like looking up the quotes, like, oh my gosh, because I agree with you guys. David Lynch's Dune is a flawed film, but it's a huge part of my childhood. Huge nostalgia attached to it. It is an imaginative vision of Frank Herbert's Dune. Um, uh, th this, I mean, Arrival was great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like where he's going with uh, Blade Runner, though. A, I'm a little cautiously optimistic about a Blade Runner sequel in general, but I would like to see him do it. And yeah, I mean, I would like to see him do some Game of Thrones episodes. You give me Game of Thrones in space with a property that I love. I have no reason to go against this. Looking forward to it. Ken? Wow, well, I too am a big fan of Kyle McLaughlin's hair. So uh, I didn't grow up on Dune, even though it was uh, the same generation as you guys there. So uh, your passion for it, both the, the past and the potential of what we have here, is exciting. Uh, this guy, uh, Denis, is on a roll, like Dennis said. Everyone loves him. I really hope this leads to an Enemy Mine reboot, another <laughs> classic from the 80s that I really love, Dennis Quaid, Louis Gossett That's Jr. Right. Um, but yeah, this seems like a win, right? This seems like all the right parts. It's finally coming together for a project that's been talked well, about. Well, it's really exciting because he's a fan of the book from mm -hmm. being a ki as a kid. I, I don't know what his take on David Lynch's Dune is, but like sci-fi did an adaptation, like a limited series of Dune and then Children of Dune, which we were talking about. Also mm -hmm. had like elements of David Lynch's right. Dune in there with the book. And also, but it's like really badly designed costumes that look just like somebody was like, cut this out of paper and quickly wear, wear it, you know, just really <laughs> right. cheaply done, but also with a lot of love involved. So I think that the director Harrison from the sci-fi series had a lot of love for the for the book as well. So it's nice to know that the people involved enjoy the source material. You know, I also, I, I want to know his mindset and how he got attached to this thing. Do you think he was sitting around, he's like, I would love someone to remake Dune. That would be so awesome, so awesome. And finally he's in the position of like, 
why don't I just remake Dune? Like, I'm a fan of Dune. I want to see it done, so I might as well do it myself. So, I mean, I feel like this guy's living the dream, you know? Good I think, for him. I think he was pushing for it, like, you know, because he said he's been a fan of it. His name's been attached ever since they've been talking about redoing mm -hmm. Dune, ever since Berg's interpretation. Peter Berg was going to do yes, a version of Dune. They even had a ton of artwork, and, you know, that fell apart. But, you know, I think with it, with especially with Blade Runner and Arrival, he's, like, getting into the sci-fi realm, and I'm, like, excited to see what else he's going to do. Mm -hmm. My only concern, though, is if they do go the route of a movie and then a television series, is that going to turn away fans who maybe only want to watch the movie versions? Let's mm. say they do a movie and then you're supposed to watch, let's say, a season of, of, of Dune. Like, is that going to be when someone comes back for the suit card, they're going to be missing out on something? The way I see it, um, if they play their cards, right, and chronologically, it seems to be lining up to where all these fans of Game of Thrones, their series is going to end at one point in a couple years. Don't make me, me and Ken cry. Me and Ken are, sorry, are sorry. Cry. The inevitability that Look, Game of man, Thrones is going people away. People try to say, you get Westworld instead of Game of Thrones. I can't. I'm so focused on Game of Thrones. I can't, you're, you're I'm not saying instead of. I'm saying after Game of Thrones is there is done, no after Game there's a it's void. I'm just going to restart the You series. can't even say after Game of Thrones. Yeah. They won't let you. Yeah. Like, and they're like, no, 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 it goes on forever. Schnepp yeah. gets me. Yeah. Okay. Quizar's Hatterack. Yeah, Quizar's Hatterack forever. <laughs> More deep. More deep. All right. It is the moon. <laughs> All right, what's next? Okay, we're about to discuss the ending of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. So here's your spoiler warning. If you haven't seen Rogue One, stop right now, skip ahead. I have to figure out the art of reading this script and not hearing it or seeing it because I still haven't seen Rogue One. Okay. Here we go. Clearly, Lucasfilm made the gutsy move to craft an entire movie around a genuine suicide mission that actually ended in the deaths of all the major characters. But that wasn't always the case. As Edwards revealed on the Empire podcast, the ending of Rogue One was significantly different early on in the development process. The very first version, they didn't die in the screenplay, and it was just assumed by us that we couldn't do that. They're not going to let us do that. So I was trying to figure out how this ends where that doesn't happen. And then everyone read that that, and there was this feeling of like, they've got to die, right? And everyone was like, yeah, can we? We thought we weren't going to be allowed to, but Kathy Kennedy, president of Lucasfilm, and everyone at Disney were like, yeah, it makes sense. I guess they have to because they're not in a new hope. And so from that point on, we had the license. Ken, were you glad they went with the ending you saw in theaters? I am, but Natasha, you haven't seen Rogue One yet. You're breaking my heart. <laughs> You're Go killing me, Larry. <laughs> All right, get out of there. Go get out of that Seco seat okay, right now. No, I now. love uh, the ending that we saw, but what I love about this story is it shows that Lucasfilm is uh, uh, whatever you thought about Rogue One. Some people loved it, some people didn't like it. There's a lot of people in the middle because, hey, that's what movies uh, it, it, it ignite in our hearts these days. Um, I'm glad that Lucasfilm said no go dark or go different than something we've seen before because this could, even though they've already shot it, have positive ramifications on episode eight, where someone like Ryan Johnson can say, here's what I want to do, and they can go, you know what? Let's let's try that. This movie, Rogue One, needed to have that kind of dark ending to me. I would have, I thought maybe Jin was going to survive, all that kind of stuff. I'm glad it went out the way they went. I think it still went so dark they had to fix that ending to bring it back to what we saw, which I was happy mm. with. So, yeah, this is encouraging as a Star Wars fan. The big challenge of Rogue One was doing something different yet feeling similar. And part of that difference for me was the ending, which I loved. And, and this is a, a positive story for me. Yeah, it's so weird because, like, every time I talk about Rogue One. I'm like saying I'm happy that they they died. It's 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 a weird thing, but it makes the most logical sense. Uh, you know, if the original script where they survived and they they wanted to carry on with his characters, I just don't think I would have I would have been okay with it. But I don't think I would have bought it. Just like Return of the King, the one of my I love Return of the King. I love the Lord mm. of, or the Rings franchise, but at the ending. When everyone survives, spoiler, if you haven't seen Lord of the Rings and Return of the King yet, it's, it's, right. it's been a while. It's been out for 15 yeah. years. <laughs> when all of, the, all of them survive, it's, it's like, really? Because they were talking about this big war, all this sacrifice. And, you know, a lot of the, the hobbits, they're not, like, really equipped to fight. And then all of them survive. I just kind of found that a little bit convenient and i didn't want that to happen to star wars what right well at least the star wars had one ending and not 75 endings <laughs> yeah. like return of the king what there's another ceremonial march uh appendices, yeah. appendices. you know what they had they had to die because otherwise Jin urso would be getting that medal at the very end with with <laughs> with Han luke. and luke be like thanks for getting those death star she, plans she took chewies yeah exactly so i mean you know what we were talking about the other possibilities or whatever the other reshoots were where 
Vader killed everybody, like mm. killed the crew. And that's one of the main, main reasons that they had to reshoot stuff because it went way too dark. And I love that they actually made it way more Star Wars in where it had mm -hmm. the, the, they split everybody up and everybody had their own death scenes. And I think it was like, you know, it was a suicide mission and those rebels got those plans and that's what allowed them to blow up the Death Star was that weakness. So I thought it was great. I, I didn't have any problems with it except for the, the uncanny Valley Tarkin. <laughs> oh, that reminds me of one of my favorite memes this week was they had a picture of DC Suicide Squad and they put Rogue One's team and they put the real Suicide Squad. Oh on there. man, that's awesome. <laughs> Jeremy, what do you what do you think? I feel obligated to touch on the fact that the ending of Return of the King where everyone survives does touch on the unique aspect and spectrum and perspective of although Frodo did live through the ordeal, spoiler alert, he was detrimentally changed. He could not have a normal life, hence he had to go away with the elves, which is pretty much going and, li to and, li and live forever. And go, well, it's going uh, to heaven. Yeah. It's, it's dying. It's dying. <laughs> Doesn't sound know? too bad. It's, uh, it's elf heaven. And then, you know, everyone was, everyone was like, broken. And so that's great. Are you doing some kind of spell? Shame What's on you. What's going on? This, <laughs> Shame this on is you, some tolkien stuff. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So. But uh, I, uh, in terms of Rogue One, I, am gl I do want to know how, when they change it. Because if you've seen the trailer, there's a scene where Jyn Erso has the hard drive plans and she's mm. running on the beach with a bunch of people. So right. I feel like they changed that for them to die much later in production than they're leading on. Um, I think they saw it and they're like, yeah, that doesn't really sit well. I think they have to die, so we have to kill them. And I'm glad they did. It was predictable. We all in this table were like, they're totally going to die. Die, but it's one of those scenarios where when you see what happens, it goes down exactly how you thought it was going to go down. You're like, I'm glad it went down that way. You know, it doesn't. Sometimes when you see, when you predict something and then it happens, you're like, ah, oh, I called that a mile away. But the, in this particular instance, I'm glad they all died because it just, it, it, it did give an element of gravity, gravity, depth, and darkness that you don't often see in a Star Wars movie, mm -hmm. and I really like that. Yeah, I didn't want the metals, and because then, then you're like, they could have lived, and maybe they just kind of hang out in the back of Yavin, and but it's, they would be in the forefront, like, hey, you need to do that assault on the Death Star because you're like our A-team and your propaganda, and you need to go out there and get your face on posters so people recruit. So uh, yeah, they would have to die. Um, and I see no other way it could have gone down. I think it went down really well. Yeah, I think it was natural and organic. All right, uh, let's move on to buy or sell. Natasha, what do we got first? The first teaser trailer for Denis Villeneuve's sci-fi sequel Blade Runner 2049 landed well with fans of the series as well as generating interest from the casual moviegoer. Now many fans are wondering if the sequel will retain a similar R rating as the first movie. That question was seemingly answered when Screen Daily chatted with director Denis Villeneuve, who confirmed the movie will in fact uphold an R rating. My producers are finding it fun to remind me that it will be one of the most expensive R-rated independent feature films ever made. Schnett, buy or sell an R rating for Blade Runner 2049. So much flavor. I totally buy that. I mean, you know what? I mean, I'm a giant fan of the original Blade Runner. A lot of people say it's boring. I say you're boring. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a science fiction film made for adults. That's why it's rated R. So if you can't handle a, a slightly heavier, more th the more thought evoking type film, which is what Blade Runner is about. What is it about? What is it to be a human being? That's what it's asking you. And I think that's what the sequel is going to be asking you. I think the sequel, written by the same guy, Hampton Fancher, is going to be pulling from the source material Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I just got really nerdy, I just realized. Um, it's <laughs> just going to be now, God? just now. Just I guess now, yeah. Yeah, a little extra deep nerd sweat. <laughs> um, I'm very happy it's going to be rated R. Let's just leave it at that. Jeremy. That's <laughs> I was looking at your entire getup. You're like, I just now got nerdy. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really want to profess and tell people, like, if you saw Blade Runner back when you were in junior high or something, you're like, it bored me. I didn't get it. Give it another shot. You know, as an adult, you know, it, it does deserve that. It was definitely ahead of its time. Although it is a funny thing nowadays, ratings are sales pitches to the people. It's like, it's going to be rated R. Isn't that awesome? Right. It didn't used to be that way, you right. know? What I want them to do make the best Blade Runner movie possible. If it happens to get a rated R rating, fine. If it gets a PG-13 rating, fine. But just make the best thing you can. But it is, I just have to touch on the fact that it is a funny thing. It's like, it's going to be rated R. It's good, right? Like, there are even movies that are filmed to be PG-13 that they then post in post-production they make it rated r which doesn't always work out so i mean it's great that it's rated r if it's sticking to the vision of the first one building off the first one happens to be rated r then give us some rated r goodness and let's let's give us some robots yeah i'm gonna buy it as well for the same reasons like you should make the movie first mm -hmm. you should not let the rating affect the quality of your movie 
the the movie naturally goes wants to be a rated R or a PG thirteen movie, and, and this lends itself to R. The original one was they're going to go into d- some deeper themes. You're probably going to see some violence in there, um, and then as well as know know your audience as well. We're going to talk about another story uh, later on by Cell where where someone didn't really know what, who their audience was, and mm-hmm. changing the rating affected the box office of, of nice. their movie. Ken. I'll buy this because I think this movie should be ready, rated R, but that's some great insight as to what ratings cause us to do, maybe even film producers or filmmakers to do. To me, rated R versus PG-13 just means in rated R, people are going to have sex with their shirts off. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, and I always thought Blade Runner was the first Han Solo standalone movie, which might have been why I was confused when I saw it. Um, but uh, this is good. This is an easy buy for me. Just let this filmmaker go with little to no limitations on what they want to do with this uh, pretty highly anticipated property. This also means that the Enemy Mines sequel might be R-rated when it's finally made. I think it's going to be called Enemy Mines with an S. And by the way, see the final cut and stop asking me that on Twitter. Everyone's like, which version should I see? I get that at least once a day. The the final cut is the one to see. Check it out. The one without the voiceover, right? Well, it's it's the one without the voiceover. There's five different versions. See the final, final version. It's the one that he finally put out. It's called the final cut. Yeah, I think four cuts, four of the five cuts don't have voiceover, and then the American one's the one that did have the noir voiceover. Well, yeah, I think, yeah, it's like there's two ones. Also, the work print, I think, has a voiceover. Nice. All right, what's next? According to a report from The Hollywood Reporter, Splendid Films has acquired the German rights to The Expendables 4, the third sequel that was previously distributed by Lionsgate. The film is expected to begin development with a potential release date to be determined in 2018. For fans of the franchise, there's unfortunately no other news or specifics given, so it's not known who will return for the fourth entry at this time. However, the report does mention that this entry will be the last, so many fans are assuming will get one last adventure with the main players. Jeremy, buy or sell a fourth Expendables movie. Fourth Expendables. Uh, I think that. <laughs> okay, I'll buy a fourth Expendables movie on the premise that it's the final Expendables movie. I, I, I guess I have to preface it that way. It's like the Expendables was a neat concept. Um, then Expendables 2 happened, and it was, it was better. I like the one with Van Damme. Was that the second one? That is the second sure. one. Yeah, That's yeah, the best yeah. one. Right, right, right. Sure. That's yeah, the yeah. best the, one. The second one was the best one. third one is taking a step back. It's like, I will buy it. if it, It's like someone going, all right, you have to go get your teeth pulled from the dentist. It's the last time you'll have to do it. It's like, okay, I guess I'll do it if it's the last time I have to do it. It's like that last thing, that last moment of pain as a send-off, knowing you don't actually have to do it again. I think they should stop the Expendables movie. The, the, the gimmick is now done. Um, they probably should have stopped at three, but if they're saying four is the last one, then let's have four be the last one. So I buy that four is the last one, though I sell the fact that they needed to make a four. <laughs> <laughs> that makes any That's sense. right. Uh, Ken? Look, uh, uh, personally, I might sell this whole franchise, but I buy it just from a, a business standpoint and an entertainment standpoint because uh, the world needs bro porn. That's what uh, you guys put this in on their Blu-rays in the gym and they work out. I've seen it happen. Um, but, yeah, this this uh, I do like that, hey, let's kind of bring this to an end. Let's have a fun run for what it was. Uh, it, it entertained a lot of people. I'm glad we're not going to have Expendables 8, which crosses over with Fast 11, and uh, get this kind of giant action. I would see that. Yeah. I don't know what right, you're talking about. Let's sell. Let's buy that. We just got go picture, kids. Uh, that'll be good. But yeah, I'll buy it. Let's we'll skip right to Expendables Eight. I don't need to see four, five, six, or seven. Just Expendables Eight. eight. Let's go. go. I sell this. I think the reason I sell it is because they added that tagline. This is the last one. We promise you. Screw you. Don't make a fourth. I hate these fourth films that show up out of nowhere after you've got a trilogy. And they're like, no, seriously, this is the last one. Why would you even sell it that way? That's just stupid. To me, I'm like, I hate when I hear like, well, we're making another one, but we promise you this is the last one. Like, we guarantee you this is going to suck balls, but we're still going to make it, and we'll never make another one after this one that we didn't. No one asked for. That's a no one asked for an Expendables 4. No one. And now they don't even know if they have Stallone. They don't know if they even have Chuck Norris available. Yet they're going to make it, and yet they're promising it's the last one. Screw off. I actually am going to buy this. I, I actually enjoyed the second one. The, the, the second one was great. The second one, because I thought the second one understood what it was. Mm-hmm. It had a tongue-in-cheek humor. Mm-hmm. You talk about Van Damme. You talk about Chuck Norris. They kind of knew what they were doing. That's why the first one I didn't really care much for it, because they took themselves too seriously. And then we mentioned before about the, the Blade Runner thing. 
why was the third one PG-13? Stupid. St- Stallone kept talking about, oh, people were clamoring for it. The younger generation was clamoring to see this. No, they weren't. <laughs> younger generation men in their 50s? Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm sorry to break it to Stallone. Most of the people of the younger generation don't know everyone that, that's yeah. in these movies. Grandpa, you know? who's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so so I'm, I, I'm hoping... Because the third one, I, I liked it more than the first one, but I did think it was a, a step back. Hopefully this last one, they, they write the ship. This is not it, the last one either. They're lying. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, we last swear one, it's the last one. Expendables 5. The fourth, yeah. led it makes fifth. a ton of mo- money. So then, much they'll, bullshit. They'll, they'll make a fifth I one. hate this fourth, <laughs> this fourth movie bullshit. We swear it's the last one. Liars. <laughs> All right, what's next? In a recent interview with Cinema Blend, Martin Scorsese was talking about his latest movie, Silence, when talks turned to his next movie, The Irishman. Based on the Charles Brandt novel, I Heard You Paint Houses, it was revealed that the movie would include Robert De Niro and Al Pacino playing both their younger and older selves. Scorsese then confirmed that he would utilize de-aging technology in order to pull this all off. You don't use prosthetics, makeup, they have acting, and the technology is able to have them go through different time ages without the prosthetics we were able to film bob and just do a scene and we saw it come down to when he was like 20 40 60 so we're looking forward to that from that point of view for the irishman imagine seeing what de niro looked like in the godfather two days that's pretty much how you're going to see him again dennis do you buy or sell scorsese's using de-aging technology for the irishman I'm going to buy this because I trust Scorsese. If anyone watched the show knows Scorsese is my favorite director. So he's someone that, like, in his hands, if he sees it on screen and he doesn't buy it or he doesn't think it's good enough, he's not going to go with Mm -hmm. it. And uh, as far as the technology, it's getting better and better. I mean, we saw in Civil War, we saw Robert Downey Jr. Look, there was still some uncanny valley stuff in but there. But that was because it was a computer it was a computer simulation, yeah, so it's more forgivable. Yeah, kind of. But I mean, you know, they tried their best <clears throat> with that one. But I mean technology is just getting better and better. So I have a feeling if if he trusts it, you know, Scorsese is someone that's always open to technology. Even though he's a big proponent of film, mm-hmm. you know, he has shot on digital before. And so I think this is another thing. It, it's gonna be weird. And and they also have all the they talked about they had a huge archive because they have all these actors in their previous film, so right. they'll be able, they'll be able to analyze those and be able to recreate those. Uh, what do you think, Jeremy? That's actually a really good point about having all the archive footage and be like, all right, let's really line it up. It's in the same universe as uh, as Civil War, but I thought the best I had seen was young Michael Douglas, young Hank Pym mm-hmm. in Ant Man. Yes. When I first saw that, I was like, that is truly remarkable, you mm-hmm. know. And that alone, like if it was just Robert Downey Jr. or a couple other uh, characters that we've seen. I'd be like, eh, but you have a good point that Scorsese is a man who's like, hey, if it's good enough, it's good enough. If it's not, it's not. I feel like he's already seen where it is. And so he's like, I feel like I can green light this right now and I can go ahead and get to work on it. But it's young Michael Douglas in Ant-Man that makes me go, yeah, I think that it can actually work. So I'm going to buy it. Yep. Yeah, this is the Benjamin Button uh, technology that I hate. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to bring well, the, that out. <laughs> if you were going to get through this without the snap cars. Yeah, that stuff. <laughs> but... <clears throat> I have to buy this simply because it's Scorsese and I trust him. He's a master director, a master filmmaker. And if anyone is going to do this uh, technology a service, it's him. Like, I didn't like the Tarkin, you know, computer cinematic cutscenes that we talked about earlier. Um, they just didn't work for me. It took threw me out of the movie. I felt I was watching a video game or something. Um, but uh, with Scorsese, he knows how to set up shots. He knows what's going to work. I think he's going to take his time and make all of the de-aging sequences work flawlessly. So I completely buy this. Ten. I, for one, welcome our new CGI overlords, and I submit to them fully. Uh, this is a weird time. I uh, I buy this simply because, like you guys are saying, if Scorsese's sitting around going, "Bobby, we're gonna we're gonna put we're gonna make you a computer," and he gets behind it, that makes me trust something a little bit more. That doesn't mean the technology is there mm-hmm. yet, but we're getting there. We're getting to that scary point um, where you know, yeah, the Tarkin thing. I I didn't mind it as much as you, but I still look at it and I'm like, I can't believe what, I'm. What you looking. can't tell I'm a computer because yeah. of my mouth you, bag not yeah, moving uh, right? But you know, uh, this this what this leads to might be scary, but it's also the time 
time we're in, and it's kind of exciting. Imagine I could use this technology for my Tinder profile. It, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting older. I could use this to lower my eyebrows. Look at De Niro's eyebrows. Make those things younger. Um, this is an interesting point, and I buy it for the big picture. All right. First of all, spoiler alert for you two. You guys, uh, spoilers. But um, you're you're liking this, Ken. I know why you're liking this because when the when the robots and the machines become self-aware, they're gonna be like, that guy had faith in us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Good yeah, job. Right. He, he submitted right away. <laughs> right. He didn't even now. give up he, any he resistance. He called us a masters and overlords. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You shall be at the right hand of the robo gods. Good job, Ken. That is well played. Well, man. I'm instantly incinerated then. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> robot masters. Another another thing you mentioned is it's not quite there yet but then if you think about like they haven't started film you know filming these things they're probably just doing tests and of course it takes a while with his films look yeah. at silence that was supposed to come out a year ago and it's barely coming out this year so i figure by the time we see the irishman this technology will be uh, hopefully as good as we hope it's going to be all right what's next okay a new trailer has been released for war on everyone the new movie from john michael mcdonough that stars alexander skarsgård and michael pena skarsgård and pena play terry and bob crooked cops who try to blackmail and frame every criminal they encounter but they uncover a larger conspiracy when they try to pull one over a strip club manager the movie is set for release on february 3rd 2017 schnepp buy or sell the new trailer for war on everyone I'm gonna tentatively buy it. I mean, his other two films, he's one for one. Uh, the Guard, if you haven't seen it, is an incredible film starring this guy Gleason and Don Cheadle. It's fantastic, it's funny, it becomes a buddy cop film. R had elements of this, it's very funny, and this trailer is very funny. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy this trailer because it feels like he's going back to that kind of a film that he did so masterfully. Uh, Cavalry uh, was pretty horrible, I thought. It was very disappointing. So. For me, like he's one and one, but this trailer really puts me at, you know, hey, he's going back to some material that he did really well. So it looks it looks funny. Ken? I wasn't expecting to buy this, but I'm gonna buy it because that was a really funny, interesting, different trailer. I kind of like that kind of stuff. Uh, the good guys or uh, the other guys even, I sometimes uh, thought, think that had some merit. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, the Shane Black uh, masterpiece in my mind. Uh, this kind of reminded me of that a little bit. And again, I wasn't expecting it. It's got a good cast. Uh, Paul Reiser, come on, man. Yeah. I'm mad about Reiser still. <laughs> uh, Tessa Thompson, who I still hope shows up in the Rogue One movie as, as Santa Staros. Uh, a, a powerful, fun cast and, and a trailer just kind of caught me by surprise. I'm going to buy it. Jeremy? I'm actually buying it, too. I mean, it's dirty, hairy, buddy cop comedy. For some odd reason, that appeals to me. And it's Pena that really puts it over the top and makes me go, okay, cool. I mean, that he's just one of the most talented people who can do comedic roles. Uh, serious roles, dramatic roles, weave them all into the same movie if he really needs to. So I am buying this. The trailer had me chuckling. Um, I want to cautiously buy it, but certainly buying it. Uh, while I'm a fan of Alexander Skarsgård and Michael Pena, it's, uh, you know, Skarsgård from True Blood, he also had that small, tiny role in uh, the first Zoolander. He's one of those male models. Uh, right? Michael Pena, I think, is always great. It's great to see him in kind of a code lead role, but just purely on the trailer, I'm going to sell the trailer. I, I just thought the trailer wasn't well put together. You know, they kept having those quotes from the one, same one guy. Over. Right. We've got this covered. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. Uh, they keep, you know, jumping to that. I just didn't think the trailer was that put well put together. I think this is coming out on Direct TV. I think uh, on video demand. I actually think the movie itself will be good. I just I don't like how this trailer is put together. All right, guys. Uh, now we're moving on to our weekly segment opening this week, uh, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Natasha, can you let us know what's coming out? Yes, Sing is opening this week. Dapper Koala Buster Moon presides over a once grand theater that has fallen on hard times. Facing the crumbling of his life's ambition, he takes one final chance to restore his fading jewel to its former glory by producing the world's greatest singing competition. Five contestants emerge, a mouse, a timid elephant, a pig, a gorilla, and a punk rock porcupine why him is also opening this week during the holidays loving but overprotective ned played by brian cranston travels to california to visit his daughter stephanie played by zoe dutch at stanford university while there he meets his biggest nightmare her well-meaning but socially awkward boyfriend laird played by james franco his panic level escalates even further when he learns that laird plans to ask for stephanie's hand in marriage Ken, uh, out of these two movies, which one are you more interested in seeing? Or are you interested in seeing both? Uh, I'm interested in seeing why him. It's it's funny 
you know, counter program to some of us, Rogue One or stuff like that. And you know, Brian Cranston is very funny. Malcolm in the Middle, Seinfeld, Dr. Tim yeah. Watley. Come on, I like to see Cranston uh, stretch himself back into that comedy world and let people r kind of remember that he is a funny guy. Franco is an interesting character. I, we talked about him uh, yesterday about what he, you know, from Planet of the Apes to, you know, Spring Breakers, all the stuff. Uh, it seems like a perfect casting because I think anyone whose daughter uh, dated James Franco, they'd be like, excuse me, Tim? <laughs> so it'd be fun. Uh, Sing, obviously not my style. Uh, I don't have children, never will, so I don't have to see Sing. But <laughs> You know what? I was in the theater when the, some of the stuff popped up before Rogue One, and a lot of people reacted to it. So in this business, you gotta—I have to react that, and I think uh, react to that, and I think uh, I think a lot of people are gonna enjoy that movie and take the family on Christmas Day. Schnepp, uh, any one of these two movies interest you? Oh, definitely. Why him? I mean, I think that pairing of Brian Cranston and Frank, uh, just from the trailers, made me laugh. I like the dynamics. I like Cranston is incredibly. Com talented comedic actor that a lot of people forget about because of the seriousness of Breaking Bad but so it's fun to see him having fun again on the big screen so I've, I can't wait to see that sing I've been reticent to even see it but you know a pig doing the flash dance moves uh, punk rock armadillo it's you know a porcupine let's whatever. go together Schnepp. Yeah, let's hold right. heads and go together let's it, sing dude. along man let's, let's sing along man <laughs> Jeremy yeah I, I'm gonna I'm going to echo why him, and I'm going to add a little bit to uh, Brian Cranston's comedic resume as Mr. Saksky in King of Queens, the next door neighbor. Mm. <laughs> Dude, people don't. Like, By all means. They totally forget that before he was cooking meth and breaking bad, this guy was a comedic actor. So it really is funny. We can have that intensity of Heisenberg as a protective father, but bounce off of Franco in a comedy. I think you have, uh, you have yourself some comedy gold with Franco. Well, yeah, you take one look at this guy, and you're like, my daughter would not date that guy, you know. I'm with you, Ken. You know, we're gonna we're gonna adopt together. That's the only way I'm having kids. <laughs> but you know, uh, but uh, I can see why a father would be like, hell no, to dating that guy. I'm not gonna catch Sing before I fly back with the family for the holidays. It's just the way it's gonna go down. I have three reviews. I gotta get up as it stands. Why him is one of them. So why him? Uh, Sing. I'm like. I think when this maybe comes out on HBO or Netflix or something like that, I'll, I'll have interest in watching it. But I'm not going to rush out to the theater. Why Him is one of those movies where you, you hear it on paper, you hear who's in it, you're interested, but you're not sure if it's going to be a total bomb or whatnot. But then you hear some good buzz coming out of this film. I'm one of those people who isn't sick of James Franco and, mm -hmm. and, and his shtick. I think he's actually funny. Um, and then, of course, Brian Cranston, you guys mentioned before, all his comedic roles before. Yeah, Tim Watley's. And he plays, like, different <laughs> roles, too. It's not like he's playing the same comedic role mm -hmm. all the time that some people complain about, you know, let, let's say a Will Ferrell or something. like. He actually plays different types. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that one. Um, all right, guys. Uh, Later on, we're going to take your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video. But I also want to mention that uh, Collider Jedi Council is going to be, we have a special episode breaking down Rogue One later today. Also, we have Tuesday's Schmodown. Uh, that was the Star Wars special with uh, Ken over there and John Campia, the Jedi Council, representing, taking on the Force Bros, which was Sam Witwer and Freddie Prinze Jr. This is already kind of blowing up. There's a lot of controversy <laughs> over this thing. I, I, I can't say much. I feel like Bret Hart in Montreal in 1997, if that uh, pro wrestling reference means anything to anyone out there. John Campia and I will have our response uh, this uh, Friday on the Schmodown Spectacular. I've been advised by my lawyers, uh, it's really just Mark <laughs> Riley in the corner, that I can't say anything until then. Yeah, and uh, then a ri another reminder, the Schmodown Spectacular, which is five matches, two title matches, Dan Merle versus Mark Ellis for the singles title and we also the uh who's it top 10 versus the patriots for the the tag team championship that goes up on friday that's three and a half hours of schmodown movie trivia goodness uh before that i also want to mention we have a crash course video that was uh done by ken you were in this one as well apparently i like star war yeah and uh they star war to star about war there's I, only I, one I, I am a fan of star war <laughs> <laughs> I play with the laser swords. Yeah, this was a fun theory. This wasn't necessarily our theory in the no. office. It was talked about. We decided we wanted to go in and explain what the theory is. You could say it's wrong. You could say it's right. Some people have been writing me some interesting theories. There's a Ray is a clone theory. We might mm. have to go into that one. I like that. Um, but it was interesting and fun to put together and do. All right. Uh, let's play that right now.
Is Rey a descendant of Obi-Wan Kenobi? We don't know, but that's the Star Wars theory causing a great disturbance in the Force right now, with fans chomping at the bit to find out who the identity of Rey's mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, or even her father's brother's nephew's cousin, former roommate is. Daisy Ridley, Rey herself, said that after seeing The Force Awakens, she thought the answer was obvious, claiming the answer to Rey's lineage might be in the movie. Now Star Wars fans are buzzing with the intensity of Tatooine's twin sons as they look for clues all across the Star Wars galaxy. The movies, the books, the comics, and most importantly, the animated series, The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. They have dug through it all, and what has emerged is a pretty popular theory. Obi-Wan Kenobi is Rey's grandfather. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, so Crash Course is here to break them down for you. So, where to begin? Well, let's start with the man at the center of it all, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now that's a name I've not heard in a long time. While first presented to us in A New Hope as a crazy old wizard with a pretty comfortable looking adobe near Mos Eisley, Obi-Wan Kenobi is a Jedi Knight from the days of old. And Jedis have vows. Attachment, as Anakin said, is for men. So is possession. But love? No, 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 no. A Jedi can love. And Obi-Wan did love. I have a bad feeling about this. In season two of the Clone Wars animated series, we meet Duchess Satine, the pacifist leader of the Mandalorians. Obi-Wan shows up to help her with the Death Watch, and in the course of those events, we learn that Obi-Wan and Satine definitely have some strong feelings for each other. It's so good to see you again, Obi-Wan. Anakin even teases Obi-Wan about it. I'll take care of this, Obi-Wan. You, go find your girlfriend. Right, but no, Anakin, she's not my... By the end of her story arc, Duchess Satine makes it tragically clear. She loved Obi-Wan and always will. So sweet. Does this mean Obi-Wan and Satine got together, had a kid, and that kid led to Rey? Well, like most theories, no one knows for sure yet. But let's play this out. Obi-Wan plus Satine equals Sabine? Yep, that's where this theory goes. Sabine Wren, the explosively awesome member of the Star Wars Rebel team from, you guessed it, Mandalore. How are the fans connecting this thread? Are there holes in it? Sure, again, this is a theory. You see, in the Star Wars Rebels episode, Visions and Voices, Ezra Bridger and Maul meet again. Yes, Maul is still alive, he has robot legs, it's a thing, but trust us, a cool thing. You disappoint me! They travel to Maul's hideout on his home planet of Dathomir, bring back the ghosts of the Night Sisters, a coven of dark magic-wielding witches, and learn some key things. Actually, we all learn some key things. One, there's a picture of Duchess Satine on the wall, Maul's wall. Maul, as it were, killed Satine with two, the Darksaber, an ancient Jedi weapon, a one-of-a-kind lightsaber that was stolen generations ago by the Mandalorians. It ended up with Maul, he killed Satine with it, and now it's displayed in his hideout like a macabre keepsake. Ezra wants to know what the Darksaber is, Maul won't tell him, simply saying Ezra's Mandalorian friend, Sabine, could explain it better. Three, at the end of the episode, Sabine takes the Darksaber, but not before a rather poignant pause. Oh, also, duh, we forgot. Four, while the ghosts of the Night Sisters dance around their brains, Maul and Ezra get a vision that reveals something important. Ezra claims to now know who can help destroy the Sith, Obi-Wan Kenobi. So, wow, in that sequence, we have Obi-Wan, Satine, the Darksaber, Ezra, and Sabine all tied together. That's a lot of ingredients for a conspiracy theory stew and this one is simmering. Is it a leap to say Sabine is the offspring of Obi-Wan and Duchess Satine? Absolutely. The character design of Sabine, clearly one with an Asian heritage, leads one away from that thought. Then you have to consider that we've already heard that Sabine's mother, so far not revealed in Star Wars lore, was a Mandalorian who was part of Death Watch. But theories never stop for all the facts, and this wouldn't be the first time in Star Wars that a character wasn't quite given the proper information about their parents, because, you know, everything is true from a certain point of view. Right, Obi-Wan? A certain point of view? So let's just play this out. If Sabine Wren is Obi-Wan's daughter, maybe she could end up with Ezra. After all, it's clearly established in season one of Star Wars Rebels that Ezra harbors a bit of a crush on her. So, could Ezra and Sabine Wren be Rey's parents? That would go a long way to make Rey strong in the Force like Ezra and have an innate level of awesome physical skills like Sabine. Plus, you know, Obi-Wan's midi-chlorian levels are probably pretty high too and might get passed on. You don't need to see his identification. 
And you'll drop your weapon. And I'll drop my weapon. Or, or, what if at some point on the Star Wars timeline, Sabine ends up with Luke Skywalker? Yeah, that's right. If he can fall in love with Mara Jade in the EU, then he can experience love here. So, Obi-Wan and Duchess Satine gave us Sabine, who got with Luke, which gave us Rey. That's right, Obi-Wan Kenobi is Rey's grandfather, and Luke is her father. Everybody's theory is right. You want the impossible. Now, of course, this is just speculation, fun, harmless speculation. I'm not some sort of seedy Star Wars bookie running bets on Rey's parents. And there you have the latest Crash Course. Thanks to Ken and the rest of the Crash Course team for making that. And you can always catch new Crash Course videos uh, Sunday. Uh, now we're moving on to a mailbag. What do we got first? Sam writes, hey guys, just check the movies coming out next year and surprisingly, March is packed. We've got Logan, Kong Skull Island, Beauty and the Beast, Power Rangers, and Ghost in the Shell all coming out one week apart from each other. If you had the budget to watch only one of those, maybe two if you stretch, which would you choose? Cheers and keep having fun. Jeremy, which one would you, if you only could see one of these, uh, which one are you going with? I'd have to do Logan, okay. dude. Like, I mean, I'd have to do the the final chapter wrap up to uh, the the quintessential flagship character of the X Men movies. It looks great. The trailer was great. The tone was great. I hope it lives up to it. It's between that and Kong Skull Island, but Logan wins out ever so slightly. Okay, so Kong Skull Island would be your second choice. That'd be then. my second. Choice. Okay, Ken. I would like to support Mark Ellis and say Beauty and the Beast, but I'm not going to. Sorry, Mark. Um, but uh, I'm kind of with Jeremy. Uh, Logan is intriguing to me. I like that kind of version of a superhero movie. What that kind of movie is, though, we'll see. We'll play out. But at least the trailer paints a different picture for me. Uh, as someone who doesn't go to every superhero movie, that's got my interest. Um, and Col Kong Skull Island, just, uh, you know, John Goodman, 60s music and explosions and giant apes. I'm in. And maybe if my budget, I'll stop buying Funko pops that month mm -hmm. and maybe I can afford to see two. You said you don't watch every superhero movie. I, I might get slave for this. I'm not a giant superhero guy. I'm okay. a Star Wars guy. That's different. Um, but Which like, ones have you skipped out on? That um, just didn't pique your interest. Oh, uh, gosh. I'd have to go. A lot of the Thor stuff. Like, okay. I love Doctor Strange because, for me, it brought in a different spiritual element that I don't see a lot in the other ones. And, and I definitely go Marvel. Uh, Marvel gets my interest. It's just I didn't grow up with them. Mm -hmm. I grew up reading Robotech comics okay. and Transformers <laughs> and G.I. Joe. Not so much uh, Superman, Batman, Iron Man. Schnapp. Well, I'd definitely, if I had to pick two, it'd be Logan and Ghost in the Shell. Uh, Ghost in the Shell just really intrigues me. I really want to see, because I love that anime, and I love the movie, and I want to see what the filmic version is, is uh, how they translate. So uh, close third would be Kong Skull Island. I guess it could be neck and neck. If I had to flip a quarter, it'd be Ghost in the Shell or Kong Skull Island, but definitely looking forward to seeing Logan. Yeah, I, I think across the board, we all want to see Logan first. I mean, for me, ever since they had announced way back in the day when Aronofsky was going to do the Wolverine and do an R-rated version, I was excited for it. And it looks like we're getting, not with Aronofsky, but now with Mangold, that they're going to do the version that I always wanted to see. And then second, Kung Skull Island, just because... I didn't hate the, the Peter Jackson version, but definitely it was need to be trimmed down. And this version looks like they want to get him in fighting shape so he can fight Godzilla. So this is almost like, to me, is like a prequel to, <laughs> right. to Godzilla versus King Kong. All right, guys, and now we're moving on to live Twitter question. You, you can tweet us at Collider Video, and we'll pick out a few. When do we got? First one comes from Canadian Pat 493 who writes, what actor do you believe adds instant credibility to any project they attach themselves to? For me, it's Christian Bale. Uh, Christian Bale is one of them. I actually watched a movie that I hadn't seen before. It was uh, uh, The Flowers of War by Zhang Zimou. He mm -hmm. was in that. I didn't know he was in that movie. Um, he's one. Daniel Day-Lewis. I mean, Not any sure. movie he's doing, you just have to pay attention <clears throat> to. Even like his next one, I think he's doing with Paul Thomas Anderson about like uh, fashion in the in France in 19, like, I don't care about any of that stuff, right. but because Daniel Day-Lewis is in it, I, I, I care. I just want Daniel Day-Lewis to make my shoes someday. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. a cobbler. Yeah. Um, D John Goodman, because we okay. were mentioning him just a minute ago, mm -hmm. any movie that he's in instantly gets a little bit better. Jeremy? Yeah, for me, uh, I, I had one of my, I mean, keeping in mind, no one's really impervious to bad movies. Um, 
uh, Gary Oldman was one uh, a favorite oh, yeah. of mine for years, uh, still is, and uh, Leo DiCaprio. Uh, those two, if they're in a movie, I'm like, yeah, I probably won't hate it. Mm -hmm. So let's watch that. Can yeah, like for me, I grew up again in that that '80s into the '90s, and once you hit the '90s, like someone like Tom Hanks, when he when he mm -hmm. went from uh, I remembered him from Bosom Buddies, and he turns right. into this uh, this leading guy. That was one of those things. As, as he's gotten older, you know, again, no one's immune to bad movies. Another one for me is uh, like Kate Blanchett, Ocean's Eight. I'm intrigued, but knowing that she's in it, I'm like, right. oh, okay, what are we gonna do here? Right. Even with something like Indiana Jones Four, which I only saw once in the theater, I'm still like, but yeah, she was in there doing some over over the top fun stuff. I might want to go back and see Ken, that. Ken, uh, I don't. Know know if you know that Kate Blanchett is in the new Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> Can't skip out on that. I think you might want to be seeing that movie. So you're telling me I, I need to like superheroes? Yeah. Okay, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, Natasha and Wendy, uh, who's someone that when they join the cast of a movie, you instantly, suddenly, it brings credibility to the film? I really want to say Michael Fassbender, but I can't say it after then, seeing then you Assassin's, saw Assassin's Creed. Creed. <laughs> I'm going to go with my default, Gary Oldman. He's my favorite. Okay. Natasha? Gosh, I have no idea. Um, Ken, I'm kind of in your situation. I'm, I'm into superhero movies, but I'm not like, yeah, let's do it. So I don't know. It would have to be someone probably really hot to like pique my interest. But Ryan Gosling. Yeah, Ryan Gosling. There you go. <laughs> All right. What's next? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, no Xbox over here says, Happy holidays, everyone at Collider. My question is, what is your favorite holiday movie? Uh, easy for me, It's a Wonderful Life. I, 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 I love that movie. I just remember watching it. Uh, they, they used to re... Now they don't do it so much anymore, but they right. used to repeat that movie on every channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 24-7. Well, also, there were only, like, four or five channels. <laughs> yes. Back in the day, they were like, King Kong is on... Uh, it's a Wonderful Life is on, and there's repeats of the Honeymooners. So, yeah. you know. But yeah, It's a Wonderful Life is amazing. I gotta say, uh, Miracle on 34th Street, the original one, starring my gal, Holly Payne's granddad, John Payne. Check that movie out. And Santa Claus is real, ladies and gentlemen. Nice. I'm in that same boat, too. Miracle on 34th Street, the original, because as a junior high theater thespian, I uh, was Fred Gailey in the Judkins Junior High production of Miracle on 34th awesome. Street. I've always liked that one there, too. W interesting outside-the-box choice for me. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's a, it's, it's a granddaddy of romantic comedies, but When Harry Met Sally, for me, incorporates Christmas and New Year's so well that, for me, I just get in the spirit, too, and, and put that one on. Also, a sleeper hit for me is Home for the Holidays, which was Robert Downey Jr., Holly Hunter in 1995. I like that one. I also have to chuck in, I always watch Bad Santa every Christmas. <clears throat> nice. Jeremy? Uh, a Christmas Story. That's the one that uh, now, now that there are like 9,000 channels, that will play <laughs> on repeat Christmas Eve and Christmas. But A Christmas Story is just, it's just perfect in the sense of what it's building and what it's doing. You know, it's, it's endearing. It's sweet. It's great. It takes you back to being a kid, really wanting that gift. There's the creepiest Santa ever in the <laughs> mall. It's just, I mean, The Christmas Story I watch every year at least once. And I love it more every time, for sure. I actually ended up not watching White Christmas until much later oh, yeah. in life, and I end up uh, quite enjoying that. How about you, you guys, Natasha, Wendy? What, what kind of movies remind you uh, of the holidays? Elf. I have to watch Elf every Christmas one. Eve with my family. It's awesome. <laughs> Same with Natasha. Elf is my favorite. Also, Scrooged. Okay. Yeah. Ah, Bill Murray. That's Good a choice. great one. Good choice. All right, let's do two more. Okay, this one comes from Jeffrey Enderton, who writes, Will Hollywood be less motivated to make video game movies after Assassin's Creed and Warcraft? Uh, I think there will be kind of a little holdback. People will maybe want to lessen the budgets of future ones, but I think eventually they're still going to move forward with Uncharted. I'm sure yeah. Last of Us will get made. Hopefully we'll see some other properties. But I think it's more of a just a little you know bump in the road, not something that's going to totally demolish video game movies what, if, what about you guys yeah i think money's gonna talk i mean if, if assassin's creed is a success which was warcraft did that make it did well overseas yes it well it overseas oh, okay yeah. so bombed here made well overseas which uh, which made it money so i mean it, one thing it did change is i'm not gonna gush about video game movies anymore it's it's a bummer i was thinking about that last night i was thinking about the last of us movie i was like i hope it's good but <laughs> right. i don't I'm not hanging my hat on anything. So it really, this year broke me for video game movies. I'm a changed man. <laughs> they, haven't, they haven't cracked the code yet for video <laughs> games. <clears throat> They've got them realistic looking now in video game land. But uh, yeah, you know what? I'm still looking forward to Tomb Raider. 
uh, the Last of Us when they finally get that one going. I'm sure it'll be cool. But they've already got there's movies that are exactly like The Last of Us, A Girl with All the Gifts. You might as well just call that The Last of Us, but with kids. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, look, uh, I always say this. Hollywood is filled with executives just trying not to get fired. They're going to go with what is working. I think we have a couple more big video game movies in in the pipeline, so to speak, where let's Uncharted, Tomb Raider's return. Let's see if they can work. If those start to make money, money talks like Jeremy said. He knows the look of that jacket. And I think that's what will drive it. Uh, but there's only a couple more strikes on this batter before it's a game over. Yeah, I think with Assassin's Creed especially, you know, when we had that meetup in New York and people were asking us about it before we, you know, it had come out, it, they, everyone was so disappointed. And I think they were so disappointed, not just because of the property, but because of who was involved, which was Michael Fassbender. That's what gave us so much hope. And ev everyone was hoping that this was going to be the one, but it ended up not being. I was going to say, I mean, Red Dead Redemption. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many. De that's a great Western. If you just take the story yeah. from that, make a movie. I mean, I, I think a lot of the adaptations fall flat because they're like trying to, we're going to Hollywoodize it. Just tell the story mm, that we yeah. played as a, as a character in the video game and do a good job of telling that story, you win. If the Red Dead Redemption movie had a 45-minute interlude of you just playing poker, I'd be on board with that. I'd be <laughs> right. so into it. But you make a good point. That's why all the fan films on YouTube that are based around video games are so much better than the Hollywood ones because yep. it's just like low-budget passion <laughs> projects that get what is the the essence of the game and they can translate it to film or YouTube. Yeah. All right, well, uh, last one. Last one comes from Kylo Ben who writes, what is the holiday schedule for Collider Video? The holiday schedule is that we are not going to have any live movie talks next week. However, we will still have shows. We have a TV talk going up, a Heroes, a Nightmares. We'll have some programming come up next week, but we won't have a live movie talk show uh, a lot of people are gone on vacation as you know john's already in canada a lot of people aren't even here at the office also uh, between christmas and new year's there's just no news there's right. not much movie news going on just because the the whole industry takes off you know that everyone else is gone so we'll be back on uh january 2nd uh with brand new live movie talks uh is that you guys have anything else to add to that no, man, you were, I, I was like, Dennis is going to know much more about this right. than I am, so take it away, Dennis. Right. I am just a, simply an Uncanny Valley computer program today. Yeah. <laughs> However, I will on my channel have, right. <laughs> have some videos up so you can check those out yeah. forthwith. Uh, I am actually going to break into the studio next week and just stream for 12 hours talking yes. about my Ray is Palpatine's granddaughter and niece theory. It's going to nice. be fun. Nice. <laughs> we're, we're looking forward to that one. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us on this episode of Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank people join us at the table today. Jeremy, where can people find you? People can find me at Jeremy Johns on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, at Real Jeremy Johns on Facebook, and I'm with Ken. I think that's a, that's a really good idea. Ken and I will be here loitering, squatting in this studio until New Year's when these guys get back. Schnapp. I'm going to hold a Gamja bar to both of their necks, and you can find me at on Twitter and Instagram just uh, at Quitsots Hotterick and also <laughs> at John Schnepp. Uh, see you later next year. Ken. Happy holidays, everybody. You can follow me at Cat Napsuck. During the break, I'm going to be working on my Enemy Mind spec script. It's going to get a green light this year. It is the year. Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everyone. Safe travels. See you next year. Wendy? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, where I'll be Snapchatting all winter break. And I'll see you next year. Yeah. Uh, and thanks to Adam and Cody in the back there. Yeah, we still have a live movie talk uh, tomorrow, and we also have mailbags coming out on Saturday and Sunday. And like I said, there is going to be programming. There's just not going to be live movie talks. You can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero or on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.